Thanks. Good afternoon. It's wonderful to be here. And, and after your spelunking piece, I wasn't sure if there was going to be some tidbit from my past that, uh, that, that showed up. It, it's really a wonderful pleasure and privilege to, to be with you today. And what I'd like to do is to spend a little bit of time uh, talking with you about, um, about Green Faith, the mission, um, the values that underlie the work that we do, and then to talk with some degree of specificity about the different things that we do, because I, I have found that very often the specificity is what gets interesting for people, and it's where the, the rubber hits the road, so to speak, and then have time for, for questions and for some discussion and some back and forth afterwards. Does that sound, does that sound good? Um, a couple of words about how, how I got started with this. Um, it's, uh, it's very interesting. You all were very polite when, <clears throat> when we were announced or when Green Faith was announced as an environmental organization whose physical offices are in New Jersey. Um, I've, I've been in, I, I spoke once at an event out in Colorado, and when, when that was announced, people started laughing. <laughs> So I appreciate your Southern hospitality and graciousness in terms of, of not, not piling on. Um, and I actually grew up in New York City making fun of New Jersey and, and ended up there 20, 22 years ago now, so it just goes to show. Uh, but as I think back in terms of my own life and what uh, got me interested and, and drew me in this direction, um, I, I served as a parish priest for 10 years in two different Episcopal churches in northern New Jersey and really loved the work of, of a pastor. <clears throat> I had gone to seminary because I was deeply inspired by the witness of a lot of important social leaders whose rationale and basis for action and core identity was really religious. So people like Dr. King and Gandhi and, and many, many others, Albert Schweitzer. Um, and I thought at a certain point in my career that I was going to be making a transition from one parish to a next, and the search processes were, <clears throat> were not going well, and I was frustrated because I didn't know why I wasn't able to find the, the next place that I was supposed to be. And in the course of that time, I found out about a small group that w at the time was called Partners for Environmental Quality. And they were trying to find ways to engage religious groups on the environment and they were having a lot of problems with it. They were getting some reception, but not a whole lot of traction. And I, I became involved, did some, some volunteer speaking engagements for them, and became involved in some of the meetings. And at one of the meetings, the <clears throat> conversation turned sort of somber because they were thinking that, that maybe they should fold up their tents and go out of business because it just was hard to get things started. This was in the late 90s. And I spoke up and said that I thought that was a ridiculous idea because it was so clear the connection between care for the earth and, and religious and moral and spiritual sensibilities. And they essentially said, well, if you think it's so interesting, why don't you run it? And <clears throat> I went home <clears throat> that night and thought and, and uh, said, you know, this is really what I feel called to do. And, and that was 11 years ago now, and I'm, I'm deeply grateful for it. And uh, one of the major inspirations for me is that when I, when I got to thinking about it, I realized that the place where I meet my Lord uh, most regularly is outdoors. And I also have come to understand through a very large number of interviews and conversations I've had with people from every imaginable religious background, and also, frankly, with a number of people who use the word atheist to describe themselves, though, though I think there's more going on there in some sense, um, a, a vast majority of, of people have that same experience where some of their most vivid, life-giving, life-defining experiences happen uh, outdoors. And I'm going to say more about that as part of the uh, very profound religious spiritual basis for the work that we do um, because we find that it, it resonates over and over. Um, what I'll do is, is talk a little bit first about why this connection between religion and the environment is, is important. Talk some about the challenges that, that we find that we face on a very concrete level when we work with, with peoples of faith and talk about our responses. And, and underlying <clears throat> everything that I say is, I, I hope, um, this theme of what I would call an alternative sacredness. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to encourage you to, to think about the fact that part of the challenge that faces the human family now, uh, and, and in particular its, its religions, is, is how to redraw 
the, the boundaries around what is considered sacred. Um, I think that religions, I know that religions have done over the millennia um, quite an important and good job of helping define human life and human well-being as having a certain kind of inherent sacredness. And the world is, is in religion's debt um, for the work that religions have done on that. Not that every religion has done it well, not that every religious group at all times does that well, but, but over the long sweep of history, uh, the fact that religious groups have, have emphasized over and over again that there's an inalienable dignity to, to, to human beings is really an important contribution that religions have made. <clears throat> we now need to, to redraw that boundary about where the moral community stands and, and what is part of it and who is part of it. And that boundary now needs, in new ways that we can't quite articulate or envision perfectly now, needs to include the natural world. Um, both for reasons of self-interest and also for reasons of in inherent rightness. Um, and so that's a theme that I hope will, will underlie a lot of what I speak. Uh, a lot of our work is, is uh, I mean, this is a, a lofty mission and we try to live it, but it, a lot of it is, is uh, highly practical in terms of how do you work with faith communities, some of which have heard about religious efforts to engage the environment and are very enthusiastic, others of which may have heard a little bit but remain somewhat clueless, um, some of which are not terribly friendly to the idea that this is part of a religious mandate or a religious responsibility, as you indicated in your, in your, in your intro. Um, we think that it's important for religions to be involved in this <clears throat> for several reasons. Before there was Facebook and Twitter, um, religions were, and in, in many ways remain, the largest social network on the planet. Um, religions are places where people of every creed, every race, every ethnicity, every socioeconomic background gather in community to affirm uh, certain common values, to live in community peacefully, um, to find ways to try to identify their deeper, better selves and how to be constructive members of the societies of which they're a part. <clears throat> Religious groups have either established, currently run, or contribute in substantial ways to over half of all of the schools on the face of the planet. Um, the educational footprint of the religious community globally is absolutely massive. There's been a, a certain sort of burst of publicity within the last couple of months nationally because the, the Pew Center for Religion came out with a study that some of you may have seen that identified the fact that a category called the nuns, and it's not like Roman Catholic nuns, but the N-O-N-E-S, people who identify as having no formal religious affiliation, has, has increased in U.S. society. Um, but, but regardless of that, both the United States and, and the world as a whole uh, remains a, a remarkably religious, um, morally oriented community. Um, religious groups are the third largest category of financial investors globally. <clears throat> and so religious groups have power not only through their beliefs, but also through the assets that they control. Um, I'll say more about that in a little bit. Um, religious groups publish more weekly magazines and newspapers than all of the secular press in the EU. Um, and I think most importantly for the environmental movement, religious groups are, are often influential <clears throat> in the more conservative or moderate segments of society, precisely the places where environmental groups are not terribly influential. And, and so I think that there's a, a tremendous um, on, an, on solely practical terms, uh, a tremendous basis for the importance of a, a connection between faith and the environment. I think that when you get beyond the, the, the mere practical dimension of things, there are some uh, sort of metaphysical or values-oriented reasons that, that this connection is an important one. Um, Religion has been one of the main ways, not the only way, but one of the main ways that human communities <clears throat> over history have created and, and articulated and described <clears throat> the values that are most fundamental to what it means to be a decent human being. Values like love and compassion and justice and equity and fairness and things like that. And in, in my experience, if one asks an environmental leader to describe 
the values that underlie protection of the environment, they will often use a term that, that is, frankly, somewhat scientific in nature. They'll say things like, well, biodiversity or sustainability. And, and my sense is that for a, a mainstream audience, biodiversity does not sound like a value. I'm, I'm strongly for it, don't get me wrong. But the way in which values get communicated, I think religions have a very important role to play in terms of helping uh, people understand in society that part of being a morally responsible person involves protecting the earth. Um, that that's a fundamental moral responsibility just as caring for those in society who are most vulnerable, just as ensuring equal justice for all. <clears throat> Essentially using religion to assert that this is a mainstream value, that it's, it's not a holdover from the 60s, it's not sort of a hippie enclave trying to make itself at home in the heartland, that it's a, a bedrock core moral value. And one of the things that is most important, I think, for environmental leaders to recognize is, is the power of religion to inspire a willingness in its adherence of people to, to look beyond their own immediate self-interest um, and to make investments of their time and their energy and their resources on that behalf. And I think that, that that's something that the religious communities of the country can offer to the environmental movement as a way to start to, to create a moral language that frames the protection of the earth as a fundamental moral responsibility. When most people hear the word environment nowadays, they think of two things. They think either of a political argument, in which case they don't want to get involved and lose friends, or they think of something that's going to cost them a lot of money in which case they don't want to get involved and lose money. And those are, are two largely negative frames that people bring to the table when they talk about the word environment or when they hear that word. Religion needs to, to make that word develop a deeply moral resonance because without that, we simply won't get the level of support that's needed socially for the very large scale changes that are required for us to continue to, to have a planet that's habitable for human life on a, on a large scale. Another dimension of this link between religion and the environment <clears throat> is, uh, I, I would use the word revelation. Um, and it, it gets back to what I was saying earlier about the experiences of the sacred outdoors. Um, there's been social science research that's been done, and, and this has certainly been, been my experience of it as well, speaking with a very large number of, of congregations over the years, that if you ask a, a group of 100 people where their most powerful spiritual experience took place, that depending on the study, anywhere between 70 and 85 out of those 100 people will, will name somewhere outdoors. And these stories are, are absolutely compelling when you listen to people describe them. Uh, but the sad thing is that, that we find that when you ask people if they've ever then shared the story of these experiences with anybody else, particularly in their, in their house of worship, uh, they have not. Fewer than 5% of people have talked about these experiences publicly. And this is interesting because in America we talk about absolutely everything. Um, you know, the whole sort of too much information is, is a very apt kind of description of a lot of conversation that happens in our society. But people don't talk about these experiences that they have outdoors. And there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is that people know <clears throat> that in U.S. culture, if you let on that you love the natural world a little bit too much, fairly quickly you are perceived as being insane. <clears throat> and there are two places in U.S. culture where we allow people to express love for the beyond human community of life. One is with pets. We're very comfortable as a society with people expressing love for their pets. And the other is, for the most part, with gardens. Uh, we'll, we'll let people love their gardens. But you go too much further beyond that. And, and people don't want to go there because there's a taboo and they don't want to cross that line. Um, and this, this sounds and is funny on one level, but on a religious level, what this says to me is that if 70 to 85 percent of people have their most profound religious experiences outdoors, 
And we are, as a culture on a wide scale, afraid to or unwilling to look at those experiences. Um, first of all, that is, uh, it's not good in terms of our own faith development because it means that we're ashamed of a way that God is trying to speak to us uh, or afraid of it. But, but secondly, it means that there is a, a discrimination that's going to happen um, that's going to hurt the earth because those stories are the places where those bonds get strengthened and where we're going to be able to find and, and use a new kind of vocabulary to talk about the nature of compassion that we have for the natural world. So one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing is creating spaces in religious communities for people to talk about these stories. The other thing that's, I think, useful and interesting about that is that having spent 10 years as a parish priest and having conducted and believe very strongly in the value of small group discussions within congregations as a way for people to grow and to learn, um, and also having spent an awful lot of time in those small groups watching the, the women do about 90% of the talking and many of the men sitting there like sort of inarticulate bumps on a log. Um, when it comes to sharing stories about outdoor experiences of God, um, I have found that men participate very eagerly and very actively in those conversations, either because they hunt or they fish or they hike, um, they're outdoorsmen of one, one way or another, and, and they get this because this is where they've met God. This is where they have experienced the divine um, often more powerfully than they've ever experienced inside of church. And, and so this opportunity to engage this form of what I would call revelation is, is something that um, has been part of the environmental movement in certain ways, but in recent decades has gotten less emphasis than it might have. And I think it represents an important asset that hasn't been adequately engaged um, on behalf of the protection of the earth. An another theme that I think religion needs to be engaged in, um, and, and you again sort of pointed to it, of course, with your, with your intro is, is this theme of, of what is the role of, of the human being on the planet. And some people, uh, some, some religious people will say, you know, it, it's here for us to use. We have dominion from the book of Genesis, and that means that God gave it to us to do whatever we want. And, and many environmentalists understandably revile that because they believe that it's licensed for exploitation. I was speaking at a uh, environmental group, a very sort of liberal environmental gathering out in California late last fall, and I, I talk about this passage when I go to environmental meetings, but this, this place was particularly fired up, and I mentioned the, the Dominion passage from Den Genesis, and they hissed. It was, it was, um, and, and, you know, I, I, on the one hand, I understand that. On the other hand, it strikes me that, that the reason that that term makes us uncomfortable is that people interpret it as a statement of value as opposed to it being a statement of fact. Um, from, from where I sit, the, the assertion that we have dominion, um, like it or not, is an undeniable fact. Um, there is no species on the face of the planet that has ever exercised the degree of power and control over every ecosystem on the planet as, as we have. And so, like it or not, we have an enormous amount of power. We really do have dominion. And the question, I think, is, is not whether that's right or not, because that's, frankly, an immaterial question. Uh, the question is, how do we use that dominion? Do we use it in a manner that is consistent with the way in which we believe God exercises God's dominion in relationship to us? Um, or do we exercise it in a manner that expresses exploitation and destructiveness? And when the question is framed that way, I think the answer becomes quite clear. Um, but it seems to me that the, I'm, I'm not willing to sort of let go of the dominion passage for the very simple reason that I think that it's both naive and too easy to say, oh, well, I don't like it, so I'm not going to go there. Because the uncomfortable reality is that we do have power. We have an enormous amount of it. Um, and like any form of power, it, it in and of itself is morally neutral. It's, re it's really a question of how it gets used. And, and our job is to, is to get off the stick and to, and to use it well. Um, oftentimes, there are any number of, <clears throat> of challenges that we engage when we, when we work with faith communities on environmental topics. When most people 
think about the, the challenges that, that they would imagine we would face, the, they name two challenges. One is they're concerned or they wonder <clears throat> about uh, people's perception that if the, a church or a synagogue or a mosque wants to do something environmental, it will cost them a lot of money. So they worry about money. They think we would get a lot of questions about money. And they also wonder about the ideology piece of the picture. You know, what happens if we run into a congregation where there's sort of a majority of global warming skeptics or something like that? And <clears throat> so that's the perception. What, what I have found at the end of the day is the, is the single greatest barrier to our being able to work effectively with congregations is the, <clears throat> the very limited amount of time and attention that we can get from the congregations that we work with. And, and by way of sort of giving us all a sense of why that might be, would you please raise your hand if you are not too busy? <laughs> I mean, it, okay, well, you, you may well be. You're one of the five people in the United States who's not too busy. I mean, this, this, we have this sort of national identity that everybody has become too busy and doesn't have enough time for anything. And, you know, when it comes to the environment, the irony in regards to money is that we can, we can almost always save religious institutions quite a bit of money through energy conservation, as, as Steve knows through his work with Arkansas Interfaith Power and Light. And I mean, it, there's, there's, there, I mean in mo many congregations, you walk in and the, the energy use is managed or is not managed to the point where you might as well put a tree with $20 bills in the middle of the fellowship hall and let people go pick them up and go burn them on a, on a charcoal fire outside. I mean, it's, it's like that. So money is, is something that we can actually help religious groups save. Um, and when it comes to beliefs and ideology, I've actually found that most of the disagreements that, that people have about the protection of the environment, at least at this point in time, are, are usually not disagreements about the protection of the environment. They're disagreements about the role of government. Um, and what I have found is that if you <clears throat> talk to someone who's a climate skeptic or who feels that they're very opposed to environmentalism, um, and you say to them, look, take, let's just for a moment, take the government out of the picture. Do you believe that we ought to be good stewards of, of the earth? Um, you know, do you believe we ought to pass a decently clean environment on to our kids and grandkids? That they say yes, and, and there has been a very long history in the United States and, and elsewhere also, but the U.S. has a lot to be proud of in this regard, of, of private land stewardship and land conservation. And there's no reason that people who may be Republican or culturally or religiously conservative can't be on board with that, and in fact, many of them are already. So I'll, I'll say more about that in a little bit, but I really find that uh, I, I sort of challenge the sense that there is this unbridgeable ideological divide that makes it impossible for us to engage with people across the ideological spectrum on these issues because it, it hasn't been our experience. Um, to talk a little bit about some of the, <clears throat> the, the work we do, we have found that when we work with religious institutions, the, the work uh, seems to break down into three basic areas. One, one of the areas being uh, what we call spirit, um, worship services, religious, edu religious education, spiritual practice, spiritual formation types of activities. Uh, a second area being what we call stewardship, which is how do you manage your physical plant, how do you manage your use of natural resources. And the third area being justice, which, which Malik Safir, Reverend Malik Safir, who's, who's here from Teresa Hoover, UMC, is, is really concerned deeply about. Um, and that's about what do we make of the fact as people of faith that, that clearly and consistently communities of color and low-income communities suffer pollution's worst impacts. And so we try to offer programming and resources in, in each of these areas, so we have a a green worship resource that includes tools for Jewish, Christian, Muslim, and Hindu faith communities to integrate environmental themes into their services of worship. Um, one, uh, just a, a sort of vignette around that, we have very good friends with a Muslim leader named Safet Chadovich, um, who's based up in the, in the New York area. 
And Muslims, one of the pillars of Islam is that Muslims pray five times a day. And in, in most cases, where possible, are, are supposed to wash themselves, perform a ritual ablution to cleanse themselves before prayer. And they do that normally with water. It's referred to as wudu, W-U-D-U. <clears throat> Safet, who went through our, our fellowship program, taught us that there is a teaching in, in the Islamic tradition that if water is not adequately available, it is permissible to use earth, actually, to cleanse oneself for prayer. There's a, a fascinating kind of irony in it. And, and at one of the interfaith services that we organized, um, I watched Safet take a handful of earth and, and rub it on his face to cleanse himself for prayer. Um, and it was, an, it was a very powerful, symbolic expression of, of deep faith. And, and it has stuck not only with me, but with many people who saw it. And, and that's part of what worship can do. You know, we, we like to think of ourselves as being largely rational creatures, but, but uh, the truth of it is that we are deeply irrational in many ways, both for good and for ill. And part of what worship does is try to harness and, and evoke and, and speak to the better angels of our nature in ways that do draw us out of ourselves towards something higher and something deeper and something better. And I think that's what worship can, can do. Um, another story about worship, uh, a friend of mine who's a pastor um, in a neighborhood in Chicago uh, lived in the neighborhood, had a lot of lovely older trees um, in it, and, and a blight struck the trees and they needed to be cut down. And there was a real sense of loss within the community about the death of these trees. They had been a defining feature of the neighborhood for many, many decades. And this pastor, um, who was fairly feisty and willing to take a risk, um, decided that there needed to be a, a ritual um, to, to mourn the loss of these trees. And so she did a memorial service for the trees. Now, this sounds weird to some people. Um, there were more people who came to that memorial service from outside of her church than had been to any other church event <clears throat> that, that she had ever organized. And so what that, that says to me, getting back to that underlying theme of sacredness, is that whether we recognize it or not, whether we are willing to recognize it or not, there is, there is something that is profoundly sacred that people experience about the natural world. And I'm not saying that everybody should be out doing memorial services for trees or whatever, but I'm also not here to say that they shouldn't be, because I think that we've got to explore and rediscover a richer, more nuanced kind of vocabulary and way of living that recognizes that we're not the only creatures here on this planet that matter and that have some kind of claim on a, on a right to be um, and a right to exist and that have an inherent dignity of their own. We do a, a fair amount of educational work, the, the Let There Be Stuff curriculum. That was a funny one. We did that in, in partnership with the people who did the Story of Stuff video, the 18-minute online film that got a huge amount of online play. Um, it was a very creatively done piece on the, on the unsustainable nature of our consumption habits. And we did a curriculum. They'd gotten approached by a number of religious groups that wanted to, a curriculum to accompany it. So we did a, a youth curriculum. We did one for Christian audiences and one for Jewish audiences. And about two months after the curriculum had been released, we'd gotten a pretty good response to it. About 3,000 people had downloaded the curriculum. Glenn Beck on Fox News heard about the curriculum, and it got him all worked up. And he went on and did a half-hour show criticizing the curriculum. And within the next week, 5,000 more people had downloaded it. So it was the best PR strategy we could have possibly done, and it didn't even cost anything. It was it spent several hours thinking about what other things can we do to irritate him so that he'll so that he'll throw some attention to us. We, we, do, uh, we do webinars. The, the gentleman in the top, <clears throat> top left there, Dr. Pankaj Jain, is our Hindu scholar in residence. And he, once a year, does a, a webinar on Hindu teachings on the environment. Down in the, the bottom left is Rabbi Larry Troster, who's our rabbinic scholar in residence. And, and he does the same on Jewish teachings. What's nice about this, this field of religion and ecology is that very few people know <clears throat> what their own tradition teaches about the environment, let alone what anybody else's does. And, and so there's a, a wonderful naivete and innocence that people come to this subject with, um, where they're open on a, on a level that they really can learn. They don't have any preconceived notions about it. 
And it's a, it's a rare opportunity to, to find that, and it's a really wonderful one. And then we do retreats periodically. Our, our meeting, the Sacred and Creation retreats, are times, whether a half day or a full weekend, where we invite church groups, religious groups, to come together and to talk about, to remember the experiences of God that they've had outdoors through different stages of their life, through childhood, adolescence, early adulthood, middle age, older age. And there are two things that, that are interesting about this. One is that people are able to recall these experiences very quickly. Um, these are not repressed memories. You know, you don't need decades of therapy to access them. Um, they're right there. They're very close to the surface. As I said before, very few people have talked about them. And when people talk about this over the span of their life, what they realize all of a sudden is that there is literally a certain kind of personhood that the wider community of creation takes on because it's been a character in their life, sometimes to comfort, sometimes to challenge, sometimes to inspire, sometimes to motivate, sometimes to remind. Um, but there, there literally is a kind of character and personality that, that starts to emerge. And it, and it strikes me that when you look back at the teachings and the, the style of religiosity of indigenous peoples around the planet, that's the closest I've gotten to being able to understand how those traditions can have expressed so close a sense of intimacy and, and ascribed such a sense of personhood to the, the beyond human community of life. It's something that we've really lost in many ways an ability to, to do and to understand. Um, when it comes to sustainable consumption, stewardship, we do a lot of work <clears throat> with religious institutions, energy conservation. Um, we've been able to identify financing for solar projects now in four states in the Northeast, and we're always trying to look for, for opportunities to, to pursue that further. Um, we've done a fair amount of work on the topic of sustainable food. We have a resource called Repairing Eden, which is designed to help religious groups get into promoting healthier food. Um, two things I think have been very interesting to me about this. One is that when it comes to a lot of the work that we do in this area, in the area of energy conservation, for instance, we often get invited into congregations by the social outreach committee, you know, by the resident liberals basically in the congregation. But when it comes to doing energy conservation, we're working with the buildings and grounds committee and the, and the treasurer. And that's not to say that they're always conservative, but they're usually not as liberal as the outreach committee. And, and so we've really developed uh, an enjoyment of finding ways to, to do this work um, that on a highly practical level turns these buildings and grounds committees into heroes um, because we can help them save a lot of money. And, and I, from having been in the parish, I know that people who volunteer for the buildings and grounds committee at their house of worship, I mean, that, that's, that's sort of, that's hard duty. I mean, that's, that's not a sort of easy volunteer job. And it's, it's been really interesting and really rewarding to find ways to, to work with these groups and to learn from them and to find out, you know, how can we make their buildings run more efficiently. The, the other piece in relationship to food is that um, there is a, a level to the food-related work that many religious groups do. Which, which is very important in terms of, of just the, the sort of enjoyment and pleasure of eating fresher and healthier food. Um, and there's also something beyond that. A, a number of years ago, the National Cancer Institute did a, a, a pilot program that they called Body and Soul. And they pilot tested it with African-American churches in Michigan and in North Carolina. And they designed this project because the data was very clear that African-American communities suffer a much higher incidence of colorectal cancer than the society at large. And the, the reason for that, it's generally thought, I believe, is that African-American households don't eat as many fruits and vegetables or don't have access to as many fresh fruits and vegetables as, as other households do. So the National Cancer Institute decided that intervening through African-American churches might be a way to get at this problem. So they designed the Body and Soul program, and it had four sort of aspects to it. The first, which was in, in certain ways the funniest, and I think probably the most influential, was that the pastor of the congregation <clears throat> was uh, sort of, in a, to sort of give a short phrase to it, was required to walk around eating carrots and vegetables publicly all over the, you know, with, but essentially, with, you know, the, the pastor had to make a public commitment to eating fruits and vegetables publicly because when you want to change a community, if the, if the leader of the community models a new kind of behavior, it dramatically increases the likelihood that others are going to follow. We, we don't like to admit it, but we're, we're herd creatures to some degree. 
Um, the second thing that, that needed to happen was that the church needed to make a commitment that they would serve fruits and vegetables every time they served food. So it, fruits and vegetables didn't need to be the only thing that was served, but they needed to be there at every meal. And, and this is important. I mean, when I'm, I'm usually out on the road preaching for about Green Faith's work, but when, I, when I'm not, I attend a small Episcopal church in Secaucus, New Jersey, which actually used to be one of the places where more celery was grown in the United States than anywhere else. Um, but not today. Um, but when I go to coffee hour at my church, and my daughter is nine, and God bless her, she has a sweet tooth as big as the Titanic. And you know, when I go to coffee hour there, I have to sort of tackle her before she gets to the sixth cookie. I mean, it's not a good scene in terms of nutrition and, and good eating habits. So, um, so the church had to make this commitment to have fruits and vegetables. They trained up peer counselors to, uh, to be counselors for fellow members of the congregation that wanted to change their eating habits and to give them support and encouragement. And they had to offer some basic cooking classes. And they found over a period of a decade sort of studying this that this program did substantially increase the amount of fruits and vegetables that member households within those congregations consumed. So this is about the enjoyment of eating healthier, but it's also about the, the literally life-saving health impacts that, that religious institutions can have in, in this regard. Um, another thing we do, we've done a lot of, of work doing uh, toxics reduction and, and uh, waste reduction, trying to increase recycling rates in the institutions that we work with. Um, I'm trying as hard as I can to get away from being assigned to, to doing waste audits. We do waste audits with teenage youth groups, and, and what those involve is the, the church saves up its garbage for three or four days or a week, and we bring a tarp out and spread, and then the teenagers pour the trash out. And as disgusting as it is, the visual impact of seeing the trash and then recognizing in most cases that 50% or more of the trash could either be composted or recycled, it, it really sticks with people. Um, what I have found you've got to do is before you allow teenagers to pour trash out, you make them swear on the Bible that they're going to help you pick it up afterwards. <laughs> because otherwise they take off and they're sort of nowhere to be found and you're sitting there sort of with your gloves on picking the stuff up. But there are a lot of opportunities for religious groups to, to manage their facilities in a way that, that respects the earth and that therefore serves as a teaching tool for their members and for the community groups that, that use their space. Um, <clears throat> the third area, I said a couple of minutes ago, spirit, stewardship, and, and justice. The, the third area of work that we do with congregations is in the, the area of environmental justice because the data, as I said, um, couldn't be clearer and, and couldn't be more tragic that, um, that the, is, it's abundantly clear that uh, communities of color and low-income communities in the United States <clears throat> have many more contaminated sites within them than do wealthier, whiter communities. The air is dirtier, the water is dirtier, less access to healthy food, less access to open space, and, and on top of all of that, less access to the decision-making processes that influence the condition of their environment. So we do on a regular basis what we call environmental justice tours, where we take groups of people to visit six or seven different contaminated sites. And understandably, most people don't go to visit pollution on purpose, right? It's not sort of everybody's idea of a good time. <clears throat> so when, you, <clears throat> when people walk up to the, the chain link fence that surrounds a contaminated site, and they hear the story about the pollution that's in the ground and the health impact that has on people, and then they turn around and down the street they see the school or the housing project where, where people live, all of a sudden it, it reframes these issues for them and it makes it so that these aren't just sort of intellectual issues, political issues to be debated, they are issues about human suffering um, and the importance of protecting human health and well-being. And we found that those tours really, really sort of turn a, a corner for people in many cases. They're a sort of a conversion experience. We do a lot of uh, traditional advocacy, um, regulatory and legislative advocacy on this, um, a whole host of different opportunities to engage this. We've also been involved in, in litigation on a couple of cases because our board, and, and I felt strongly about this, also decided that if we were really going to be faithful to our call to be religious advocates on behalf of the environment and we were going to talk about environmental justice, that we needed to be able not only to teach Sunday school but to, to show that, that we meant business. 
And so we've been successful in, in two cases. Um, we choose the cases very carefully because we don't have a lot of resources. We've never gotten any funding dedicated specifically to that. But it has taught me a great deal on, on one of our environmental justice tours, Tom Kane, the, the moderate Republican who was the chair, one of the chairs of the 9-11 Commission. He's also a former governor of New Jersey. Um, he came on one of the tours, and, and I'll never forget, after the tour was over, he took me aside, and he was very earnest and serious, and he said, you know, you've got to remember that, you know, religious groups, when they get into this stuff seriously, you can't be too nice. He said, because when I was governor, I learned very quickly that there are plenty of polluters out there who have absolutely no intention of stopping polluting. And for them, <clears throat> a fine is simply the cost of doing business. And they have no intention of doing the right thing. And then he sort of, he got sort of choked up about it. He said, you've got to sue those bastards. <clears throat> and I thought, that's, you know, I mean, that really, you know, he's, I mean, this is, he's a, he's a deeply intelligent man. He's a, he's a, a model public servant on, on a number of levels. And, and, you know, and he's a moderate Republican. I mean, it was very interesting to hear him talk about that. So that, that has meant a lot to us over the years. A couple of more words before time for some, some conversation. We realized uh, seven or eight years ago that there were a growing number of, of people of faith around the country, clergy and lay leaders, who really felt a calling to make care of the earth a, a centerpiece of their, their religious life. But there wasn't anywhere for them to go to, to study, to meet like-minded people, to learn about this, to develop some leadership skills. So we created our fellowship program as an 18-month multi-faith program. Uh, fellows come to three retreats. Everybody writes their own eco-theological statement. You can ask Malik about his. He came through our program and did a, told a, a remarkable story. People have to talk about their own spiritual experiences outdoors. Malik uh, served in the Navy and, and, and wrote a, a compelling story about his experience of God in relationship to the ocean, um, you know, being out at sea. I mean, it was very deeply moving. Um, Everybody designs and carries out a, a leadership project. It's really been a joy to do this. 115 fellows we've got currently, and it's actually up now to about 32 states, I think. We had our first European fellow this year, all of those different traditions. Um, and, and what this has taught me has been that there are a lot of people out there who really do care deeply about this. And given the kind of support and community and accountability and encouragement, that, that a place like the Clinton School, I'm sure, offers for, for you guys, a lot of good things can happen. People can go much further with, with mutual encouragement and support than they can on their own. <clears throat> and then after the fellowship program got rolling, we realized that there were congregations that wanted to, to dive into the deep end with this stuff. So we developed our certification program for congregations <clears throat> as a two-year process that these houses of worship would go through during which time they'd integrate environmental themes into their worship services, their religious ed programs for children and teenagers and adults into seven different areas of facility management. They do education and advocacy on the environmental justice issues that I talked about. They do some interfaith work. And we, we framed the program not only as an environmental leadership program, but as a congregational growth and development program in green clothing. <clears throat> because while we know that engaging the environment isn't the only way that churches and, and religious institutions can attract new and younger members, um, we certainly know that it's one way that they can do that. And we've seen time and time again with this program that it does attract and engage new leaders. You know, people in there, you know, many people, particularly people sort of age 45 and under, realize that this is a major issue for their lifetime. Um, and they want their faith community to be involved. They want to hear their clergy and see the programming of their faith community engage this stuff seriously because it's vitally important for their future <clears throat> and for their kids. Um, and so it's been a, a lot of fun. We provide a lot of support for these institutions as they go through the program. We've got 65 of them that have, have gone through, I think, in 22 states at this point. And it's just been, again, remarkable to see what they've done. And, and growing out of this, we've been approached by eight theological seminaries around the country who want us to develop a similar kind of program for seminaries, which is very appealing because what that creates then is the opportunity to influence a generation of religious leaders and to give them a, a comprehensive kind of grounding in this as an aspect of, of their ministry. Um, I'm going to wrap up now by saying that <clears throat> I've, I've talked a fair amount about things that 
religion can do for the environment. But I'd like to, to circle back to something that, that was perhaps implied in, in what I said earlier, which is that I also believe <clears throat> that, that the natural world has a great deal to offer in regards to the future of religion. Um, we live on a planet that in Tom Friedman's phrase is hot and flat and crowded increasingly, and it's only going to get more so. And uh, we also know at the same time, as I said, that for, for a very, very large percentage of the human family, the natural world serves as a powerful source of divine or spiritual revelation. And an integral part of our learning to be at peace with our home, ultimately, um, is going to involve a, a religious evolution or a religious conversion, in a sense. Um, and I would use those two words, one of them identified as quite culturally liberal and the other perhaps as more culturally conservative, together on purpose, because there is a deep turning that our religious communities, I think, will need to make over the course of the next decades, where we learn to affirm <clears throat> with profound gratitude the home that we have been given, uh, to affirm that we are an important part of a wider community of life uh, that shares this one home, and that our fates are inextricably intertwined, and that we need to learn, um, in, the, in the words of Psalm 148, um, to, to become with the earth a part of an entire choir of creation. If you look at Psalm 148, everything <clears throat> is joined in a collective praise of, of its maker. Um, not only people, not only animals, plants, landscapes, weather formations, cloud formations, everything is joined in a collective praise of God. And if you believe, as, as I do, that currently we are um, serving in a decreating kind of mode where we are um, diminishing the capacity and the beauty and the um, life-supporting dimension of, of the natural world and need to reverse that, then I think that's a, a worthy vision for what we need to make the, the work of our lives and of our faith communities. So thank you very much for the chance to be here, and I would welcome any questions or comments or agreements or disagreements or anything. Well, thank you so much for that. We do have time for just a couple quick questions. Uh, uh, we have one over here, Poppy. Yes, I appreciate you uh, talking about us coming to choir of all creation. And I was wondering what uh, your position is when you move into um, this air pollution type problem like the United Nations and other groups say that the uh, <coughs> animal factory farms produce much more pollution than all our forms of transportation, the cars, trucks, buses, planes, et cetera, et cetera. So um, just sort of want to know how you address the problem of all the pollution put out by these uh, atrocious factory uh, farms of animals. It, it's the, the question was how do we deal with the various forms of, of air pollution and other forms of pollution emitted by factories and industrial sources. One of the things that we try to... Animal sources. Animal sources. Um, one, one of the things that we try to do is, is to talk um, not only about the pollution in and of itself, but about the suffering that it causes. Um, because we find that, that only when, when faced only with data about pollution, it's harder for people to have an empathetic response. Uh, so, so by example, <clears throat> we spoke a couple of weeks ago to a, a Hindu group <clears throat> around the festival of, of Holi. And um, one of the best ways I've found to talk with Hindus in the US about environmental problems is to talk about environmental issues facing India, because there's still a strong sense of identification with the mother country. And I did some research about India. What do you think is the leading cause of death in India? It's air pollution. <clears throat> um, and, and so, we, you know, about half of it indoor air pollution, half of it outdoor air pollution. So we find that talking about, about suffering, um, in, in relationship specifically to issues related to animals, um, one of the things that we have found increasingly resonates with people is to say that from a, a moral or religious perspective, it's, 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 fundamentally, um, it's fundamentally wrong that animals are treated in the industrial agriculture system in the way that they are, that these are sentient creatures, um, that they deserve an existence that is not stricken by absolutely appalling cruelty and, and abuse, and that, uh, you know, it, that, that there's a, a broad consensus that the way in which we treat these creatures is, is morally wrong. Um, and I've found that that <clears throat> resonates quite deeply, and that then building from that point of, 
of initial connection on that level, um, it's easier to engage people about the methane emissions and the significance of reducing those and, and opportunities like Bob Joplin does in terms of the fact that through using various types of anaerobic digesters, there's actually a very valuable renewable energy source that can be harnessed out of that. So, but I find that connecting on the, I mean, one of the things that religions do a good job of is, is empathy. And I think using that as is, is a way of connecting initially is important. Last one, Annie. Poppy, right here. Hold on, Annie. That's right. Sorry. Thank you. you mentioned that sometimes it's the resistance to, we don't want government to control us. Some of the hottest public policy forums I've re experienced throughout the state of Arkansas is mega churches as they began to expand based on their membership. That at City Hall, the people who feel like Green Faith run into saying, it's about larger parking lots. Mm -hmm. It's about destroying trees. It's about causing all of the toxic things that we do. How do you address that? If it's, they have to be the role models, and then they're the ones who people are accusing of, you're just the opposite of what you say you believe in. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very good question. And it really, dis in my home state, of New Jersey, there's an area called the Highlands, which is very important because it's a place where a lot of the drinking water comes from. And there was a Drinking Water Protection Act called the Highlands Act put into place. And I, I was very discouraged to see that the, then so there were building restrictions established as part of that. And the Catholic Church successfully lobbied to have religious properties exempted from, from that act. And I thought that was absolutely horrible. Um, I think that, you know, I've, I've found that the more we can work proactively with those institutions and have them commit to some degree publicly that part of their identity is being a good steward of creation, that then when it comes time to make those kinds of decisions, if they've already made that initial commitment, um, it becomes easier for them to start to entertain the idea that maybe they can not just blacktop the whole parking lot, but put in some swales and, you know, to, to sort of have less impervious surface and that sort of thing. Um, so I think one way to do it is to try to work with them ahead of time to have them affirm that part of their identity is as stewards of God's creation. <clears throat> I think the other way to try to approach it is through a a solutions-based approach, which is rather than going to institutions and saying you can't do this, go to them and say, have you thought about the possibility of doing this? And here's a way to, to do it that you could express this as, a, as consistent with your mission and your ministry. I, I skipped over a slide um, about a resource we have called Building in Good Faith, which is a green building guide for religious institutions. And, and in there, you know, there are a lot of tips about how religious groups can, can build green, use that as a way to raise more money to support the building project, use it to publicize the mission and ministry of the church, you know, sort of to try to use it in a, in a, in a positive way as well as sort of setting a limit. It's, but it's an inexact science. It's not hard. And often by the time people are at that level of the public hearing, it's, it's, people are pretty locked in and it's, yeah, you get, you get this kind of thing and it's not easy. Reverend Harper, thank you so much for, for coming. Before we end, will you tell everyone about the uh, conference tomorrow? Yes, yep. Tomorrow, we, it has been our real privilege to partner with St. Margaret's Episcopal Church and Arkansas Interfaith Power and Light to organize an event called Ground for Hope Arkansas. Um, we have done Ground for Hope events, which are day-long education and training events for clergy and lay leaders from different religious communities to come together, meet people similarly interested, and get the tools and the resources and encouragement they need to go back to their faith communities and to get involved. So uh, the program is tomorrow, the event is tomorrow from 9, it starts at 9 o'clock at St. Margaret's, which is at 2900, is it Chanel, is that the pro? Uh, Chanel, thank you. <laughs> Forgive me, I'm, I'm from New Jersey. I mispronounce everything badly. <laughs> um, so you all know where it is then, that's good. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I hope you'll join us. The, the registration fee is $20 and you can pay at the door. There's a delicious vegetarian lunch that we'll have as part of it. A really stunning multi-faith worship service that a team of local religious leaders has put together. Um, so it'll be, a, and, and also the keynote speaker is Reverend Richard Sizek, who's a well-known evangelical environmental leader who was for many, for several decades, the president of the National Association of Evangelicals and who actually lost his job because he 
he spoke publicly and would not stop speaking publicly about the fact that he thought that addressing climate change was something that evangelical Christians should be concerned about. So he's a, he's a super guy and a, a national figure, and uh, so I hope you'll join us. And I've got a sign-up sheet here for anybody who'd like to be on our email list. If you, um, we'd love to work with your congregation. Um, Steve Copley from Arkansas Interfaith Power and Lights here. And Steve, once you, or everybody may know you. I'm not sure, but Steve, I know, I know they, I know that Arkansas IPL would love to be connected with you. So, um, thank you so much. Thank you again, and we'll see all you at the next one.